Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that your love is an overwhelming love. You love all people, including us, the foreigners, not part of your chosen people. You've loved us so much that you sent your Son to die to take away our sin. Keep us in your grace and mercy, now and forever. Amen. During the summer of 1992, I was the camp pastor at a Lutheran camp in North Carolina called Camp Linhaven. It's in Linville, North Carolina, but no one knows where Linville is. Linville's near Boone, North Carolina. More people know where Boone is. Up in the Great Smoky Mountains there. It's a beautiful camp. This wasn't the first year that I had been camp pastor there, but this was the year I decided to take my two older boys with me, Nicholas and Jacob, for the week. Every Thursday of that week, the campers would always go up to Grandfather Mountain near Camp Lynn, Lynn Haven and hike up to the top of the mountain. There were some steep spots along the way, places where you had to use a wooden ladder to get up a rock face, or they had plastic coated cable that was anchored to help you pull yourself up some steep rocks or let yourself down some other areas along the trail. But, you know, I figured we could do this. We've got this. And being in the Great Smoky Mountains there, I thought to myself, step aside, Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett, here we come. But after about an hour or so of hiking up and down the steep rocks, climbing the ladders and the trails, pushing and pulling and lifting and encouraging, that's what I called it, encouraging, my youngest boy, Jacob, had had enough. He was five at the time. He had had enough, and it didn't help that his brother didn't help him across the dead cedar tree, and so he fell and skinned his knee, and that his older brother was acting more like a drill sergeant rather than a helping brother. And so he said, carry me. And at first I put him on his, my back, and then I carried him on my side, then on the back again, and then someone else carried him. Well, you get the picture. Sometimes the journey gets long, doesn't it? Sometimes the hike gets rough. Sometimes the going gets really, really tough. Like when you're almost to the top of that mountain, and a storm cloud rolls in. Exposed as you are on that storm cloud, all you want to do is be back at camp safe and sound, but you know there's no way to make it down to the parking lot in time to escape the storm. So you try to hurry along the trail and find a, a shelter, some place to protect yourself from the storm. But that's when someone usually says, I've had enough and won't budge. By their actions, they're saying, what's the use? During the Lenten tide, we're going to explore this section of Isaiah that's not well known. Isaiah 56 to 66. It's that section of scripture where God most clearly tells the people that the suffering servant that Isaiah had been describing in chapters 40 to 55 will be a servant not only for Israel, but for all the nations. Coming to save Israel was too small a thing, as Isaiah said, for the Lord. He came to serve all people. Isaiah 56 to 66, even prophesies the painful separation between God's bloodline of chosen people and God's true descendants of Abraham, those who are children of Abraham by faith. Isaiah 56 to 66 is fulfilled in the book of Acts. Now, the text I chose for this, the first Sunday in Lent, which also happens to be Valentine's Day, um, is Isaiah 56, 1 to 8. 
If any of you guys pick up a Bible on the way in, turn to page 733. And I would encourage you to do this for the next few weeks because I'm going to be pointing back to the Bible now. In that section, if you would look at the heading for this section in, uh, in the NIV translation that we have here, it says, salvation for others. See, we get this idea that the Old Testament is all about God dealing with his chosen people, Israel. And it is that. But what we forget is the reason God chose the people of Israel. God chose them to be a blessing to the surrounding nations. That what they received from God, they would share with the rest of the world. Now, this verse that I chose from Isaiah 60, uh, 56 then, um, I chose, uh, uh, in, entitled this, um, A Loving Embrace. The most famous verse of this is probably verse 7b, when it says, uh, For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. You probably heard that before, but do you know where? Do you remember where you heard that? Jesus quoted this verse. During Holy Week, when he was running out the money changers and the vendors from the temple courts, he was shooing him out and saying, my house shall be a house of prayer for all the nations. Jesus was saying to the people there and to us that he came for all people. And like I said, since it's Valentine's Day and Jesus wants to gather all people into his house, I entitled this sermon, A Loving Embrace. Now, verse three that we're, or verse um, seven here, notice that in that verse, the word house is used three times in that verse. And in verse eight, the word gathered, or a form of it, is found three times. The message is clear. God wants to gather all nations from around the world into his house. All foreigners, eunuchs, you, me, the world into his house. Why? Because our sinful natures have caused us to stray far away from the house of God. And he wants us in that house. That is his will. That is his desire. Now in verse 3 of our text, it talks about foreigners and eunuch. A foreigner could be someone who is, um, doesn't belong to a household, but more often it, it just describes anyone who is a non-Israelite, a goyim in the Hebrew language, anyone who isn't Jewish with the insinuation that those who are foreigners are unclean idolaters because they don't know the true God and they don't have God's purity laws. A eunuch is, how do you say this, a man no longer. In Deuteronomy 23.1, God says that no eunuch will be allowed to enter his house. And so here in verse 3, the eunuch complains, I'm only a dry tree. I cannot bear fruit, no children. Foreigners and eunuchs, according to Isaiah, are far from the house of God. They're on a hike going nowhere fast. Going nowhere fast. I think sometimes that describes our lives. We get in those situations where we think life just isn't going anywhere fast for me. And Lent is one of those seasons of the year in which we can confess that we are possessed by our past, that we're mired in our malaise, and that we're taunted by our temptations. We want to be better, but... As St. Paul says in Romans that there's another law that's at war in my body. It's at war, waging war in the law of my mind and holding me prisoner to the law of sin and death. We want to do better, but I am unspiritual, a slave to my sin. 
We want our church to become better. But again, there is this law that every time I want to do good, sin and evil is right there beside me. <laughs> and so we find ourselves caught in the overhang on the top of a mountain, trying to weather the storms of life, moaning and groaning. And woe to the person who challenges me to resume my journey. Woe to the person who dares point out my self-justifications and my rationalizations. Woe to the hiker who says that I haven't budged in an hour or a day or a month or even a year. And pretty soon I find myself in this tight radius, complaining. Yeah, I would rather just sit there under the underhang and say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. Oh, don't be fooled. On the outside, I keep up my normal routine, but on the inside, it's easy to stop hiking. I go for sameness, safety, the status quo, comfort, complacency, convenience, are my bywords. And like I said, I soon find myself locked in this tight radius of don'ts, won'ts, can'ts, and quits. I assume that's the way probably Jacob felt at that time as well. Tired as he was already from the hike and knowing we had a long way to go after the storm had passed. And so I tried to convince him to get up because he wasn't going to budge. I started encouraging him, we're going to make it. It'll be okay. I'll protect you. Turning on all the charm that I could to assure him of his security. And do you realize that God does the same thing for you? when you're stuck as well? Look at verse 7. These foreigners I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. You know, why should this surprise us that God's going, calling all people? I mean, from the beginning, really, it's been about all the nations. When God called Abraham, he said that he would be a father of many nations and that he would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. It's always been about all the nations, about you and me, because we've strayed away from God's house. The Israelites that came out of Egypt... It wasn't just the Israelites. It says there was a mixed multitude of people that came out of Egypt with the Israelites. Look it up in Exodus 12, 38 or Numbers 4. Moses married a Cushite in Numbers 12. And he indicates that those non-Israelites who believe in the true God will be able to offer sacrifices along with the chosen ones in God's house in Numbers 15. You see, it's always been about all the nations. God gathering all people unto himself. God reaches out to us and he brings us in. He embraces us with a loving embrace. But even though we know that, even though we know that God loves us in Jesus, sometimes we need more. We need more assurance. And so did Jacob. So I started talking to Jacob, describing what it would be like when we got back to camp. 
I said, back at camp, we'll go swimming. Back at camp, we'll go get a Mountain Dew and a Snickers bar at the canteen. And then I pulled out the big guns. I said, back at camp, I'll let you stay up late with me and we'll go scare the big kids. God does the same for us. When we're stuck, we need someone to help us in our present path and remind us of the future deliverance. God speaks to us with words that are beyond comprehension, a love like never before. And he says to us, I will gather still others besides those already gathered. Who's he talking about here? Other chosen people or the Gentile nations? The key here is the word still. That word indicates those in addition to ones who have already been gathered. In other words, the nations. You and me, foreigners of God's kingdom. God comes to us and embraces us. He rescues us and brings us safely home. Oh, we've already felt his loving embrace and the gift of faith that he's given us. But the best embrace of love is yet to come. You see, on that day, When God brings us safely home, we will be embraced by a love that we have never known before. When Jesus began his journey, he began a hike that he remained on steadfast to the end. He finished the hike in spite of his disciples' kiss of betrayal in spite of his friends running for cover, in spite of his countrymen clamoring for his death. Look, the sky is dark. Criminals are dying slowly, one on his right, one on his left. Jesus is in the middle, and he speaks his last word. John records it. To tell us, die. It is finished. To tell us, die. The curtain tore from top to bottom. The blood poured. The curse removed. The sacrifice complete. Death is defeated. Paradise is restored forevermore. To tell us, die. It is finished. It is done. Everything has been completed. There's nothing more to do. I imagine that if Jesus' hands hadn't been nailed to the cross, he would have raised his fist in victory and said, I've done it. I have won the victory for all the nations. By the way, The hikers, we made it down safely from the mountain. We made it to the bus, made it back to camp. But there in the parking lot when we finally made it back there, I can still remember Jacob saying, I did it. I did it, Dad. And I laughed out loud and had thoughts that I kept to myself. My thoughts were, yeah, you did it, dear son, in a sarcastic way. See, I carried you, I calmed you, I encouraged you, and... Others carried you as well. But I kept my thoughts to myself. And here's why. Because I realized that my Heavenly Father does that for me every day of my life. And He does for you too. Whenever you find yourself paralyzed by disappointment, when your every bone in your body says, I can't go on, Jesus comes, finds you on that trail, picks you up, puts you back on the trail, 
and then embraces you with a loving embrace. After all, he is the greatest gatherer, isn't he? He bids all who are weak and burdened to come to him. Listen again to the gift of God's embrace. These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house would be called a house of prayer for all nations. Why does the prophet say this? So that we can pick up our pace, pick up a few hikers along the way, and then fall into the loving embrace of our Heavenly Father. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand